Well, welcome everybody. I don't see all your pic all the pictures of your faces, so I'm going to assume that you can see me and this is going to be fun. I really appreciate you taking some time out of your day to uh, join me and talk a little bit about plants and bringing your land back to life. I am at the office. I've got a, a, a jacket over my telephone, but we're pretty busy these days. So if you hear some background noises on my part, that's what life at the office is like right now. We are living in some funny, challenging, dismaying, tragic times. You can put a lot of adjectives in there. Um, and I know a lot of people are working hard to come up with the silver linings to their situation right now. Um, it is really great that Montezuma Land Conservancy is able to reach out in so many different ways and still hold our land precious, hold the people that make this land precious, you know, hold us all close and be involved in what's going on for all of us. It's, um, well, it's just crazy times. We are in the agriculture world incredibly busy right now because so many people of us, so many of us that live closer to the land and where we have a backyard or the back 40 or something, we can get out, we can do something on our land. So in the agricultural world, everybody says we've never been busier, which is our silver lining. Um, we are reconnecting with our land. We are getting to those projects that we have not been able to do for an awfully long time. And it's pretty exciting for a lot of people, I think. We do have some precious land here in the Southwest and everything we get to do to appreciate it and to keep it um, healthy and viable and not full of weeds is a really great contribution to our land as well as to your life. Um, I do want to share some basic informa information and baseline understandings, not just about native plants themselves for our area, but developing your own green thumb. And I'm not going to turn those of us who are not real green thumbs into a green thumb, but some of the principles and some of the basic ideas that help you understand the plants that you're trying to work with, how your soil interacts with those plants, etc. cetera. Um, I hope you carry a little bit of awe and joy in your soul today as you realize just how cool and amazing plants are and the living things that are on our land. For some of you, this will probably be new information. Um, for some of you, it will be very old information. You may groan and you may sign off and that is your right. I hope if you do stick with us that maybe we have a couple of ideas that are new or things that just kind of reinforce what you already know or fit some of the pieces of the puzzle together. It is a great time to be holding this little webinar and to think about your land for three good reasons. First of all, the soils are warming up right now. The temperatures are perfect for starting germination. So it is a good time to be thinking about getting out there, getting some seeds in the ground. Secondly, getting out there and working on the land is good for our physical health as well as our mental health. And I do think a piece of our busyness and what's going on right now is the mental health of doing something that is growing, living, experiencing its full range of freedoms unlike some of our lives right now. And the third reason is that if you have a problem area, if you have something that's been disturbed or torn up last year because it was the garden, something like that, weeds will win if you let them. That old saying about nature abhors a vacuum is definitely still true. And my slide presentation, ah, here we go. There we go. So thank you, Gary Larson, for giving us all a little perspective. I find he does a very good job for me many days. I don't propose to provide you with all of the answers, but I do hope that you get some fundamentals when we're all done. This is kind of our agenda for the day. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the principles of soil health, which is kind of before we actually get to the plants themselves, but that soil health can really help understand what it is the plants are trying to germinate into and grow in. 
Secondly, we're going to talk about just some key concepts about native plants. So it's a little different from growing a garden or going to the nursery and getting that really cool plant that you really like or a few potted plants to do an accent or something. When you're thinking about natives or planting a larger area, you're starting from seeds. So we'll go over some examples of the native plants with some photos of them. Um, after we talk about some of these basic concepts so that at least some of our main species around here you've got a little bit of familiarity with you could continue to explore them then i've got a few parting thoughts just about planting and um, what seeds we're going to provide you all with if you're interested because we do have some small packets of seeds that you can use for some area in your own land So first of all, the principles of soil health. This actually comes from um, the principles of cover crops. And cover crops are a concept that we've had in, within the agriculture world for hundreds of years. We sort of lost a lot of those ideas and the use of cover crops when we started getting more fertilizers and big equipment and we could go for mass production and quick production as opposed to the most healthy production for our lands as well as the long-term health of our soils. Um, a lot of these principles apply in every setting, but it does come from the cover crop world. So the first one is living roots and living roots means as much as possible, always have something growing on the land. Even weeds are better than nothing at all on the land. Now, I say that cautiously because I'm thinking of one particular role of those weeds and that is having living roots in the soil, not necessarily about how that's spreading, how that is hurting other crops, a whole bunch of other factors. But living roots is the most healthy state for your soil because roots provide many, many different factors to the soil itself. Number one, they are breaking up the soil. They are creating the space for that root to actually live. And in doing so, they are exuding, um, giving off all kinds of the cell matter that actually grows on those roots. That's good for a lot of organisms that are in the soil. That's a part of their food supply. The roots are making channels within the soil so you get better filtration, better oxygen and water ability to funnel through the whole um, soil structure. And you're making something that is called, um, now I'm gonna remember, forget the name, soil structure, soil conglomerates. So what you, in the ideal soil, it is, it's got roots, it's got all these living organisms and it's got structure, it's got, um, masses of the soil that are stuck together and then there's space around that which is how the water and the oxygen can filter down through it. Every time we turn over our soil, we, we change it, we break that up. So those living roots are kind of one of the bases of having healthy soil. The second one is keeping the soil covered. It's not always possible to have living roots all the time. Um, whether it's because we are growing annuals and so they, there is a point in time when they are not living anymore or we have had a disturbance or the dogs have torn up the backyard and there is just no way to get ahead of the dogs right now. So if that is the case, keeping the top of the soil covered with something is your next important principle that you can do to try and keep your soil healthy. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, the biggest one is that bare soil heats up more than soil with something that is growing out of it. The sun can penetrate directly onto that soil and it can be up to 10 degrees hotter than the outside, so outside air temperatures. And I, you can probably imagine if you've got little bacteria and fungi living in the top layer of the soil, hoping that there's going to be some roots coming along and it gets really hot, they don't thrive. They actually die off after a while. And so you are losing not only those living roots, but you are losing the microorganisms that interact with the roots when you have bare soil. So don't Panic if you have bare soil right now. You will build that up again as you get things growing on it. But it is a good principle. Even if you have straw, 
You have lawn mowings, other things that you can put on top of the soil to keep it a little bit cooler, to keep some of those microorganisms healthy until you can get something growing. The third principle is biodiversity. And by that, we mean as many different kinds of plants as possible. So modern farming says, grow a big field of corn, which is probably the least sustainable and the least healthy way of growing on your land if you've got the choice. Now, if you're a corn farmer, I apologize. That's what you need to do, I understand. But biodiversity, so even again, going back to the weed concept, going to um, a cover crop cocktail, which is getting as many different cover crop plants growing as possible, or a mix of flowers, a mix of native grasses, that is a really good idea mostly because every different plant has different root structures, different exudates, different things that those roots are giving off, different dynamics with different bacteria, fungi, et cetera, in the soil. So the more diversity you have, the more organic matter diversity you are able to put back in the soil, and the more you are feeding all of those microorganisms in the soil. And you want them all healthy and, and thriving. There are a few pathogens and things that are not so healthy. That's not even my area of expertise. We're not going to go there. But in general, you're better off having a lot of things growing in the soil at any one time. The fourth principle of soil health is reducing disturbances of the soil. And that's a little bit what I was talking about in that first principle with the living roots. So by reducing the disturbances, the tractor with the plow is kind of our idea of modern agriculture. A lot of farmers are realizing that that's not really the healthiest approach to grow, excuse me, to growing things on their soil. Because every time you tear up the soil, you are breaking that structure down, that ability for the water to filtrate, for the roots to be, you know, creating waterways throughout the soil and everything. So if you have a highly compacted soil, you need to do something to break it up. You will disturb the soil. If you have to put in the pipeline or a new fence or something, you're going to disturb the soil. But in general, the less you disturb it, the better off that soil is. Plants are amazingly adapted to getting those roots going down into the soil. Even if it takes them a little while, um, they're going to find what they need. Again, unless you've got highly compacted soils or some other problem like a, you know, the rocks are only two inches below the soil, you have a serious problem then. But um, the less you do, the better off for the soils. That's kind of just one of those simple principles. All right, so those were just my quick um, principles of soil health. Let's see. So now I wanna move on to some key concepts. And these are, some of them are very self-evident. Some of them are um, probably some things that might add some new dimension to your understanding of some of the grasses that you might have. Um, the first concept is the difference between annuals and perennials. And um, for many people, that's an obvious no-brainer. And then sometimes it doesn't really make sense. So at the risk of say, stating the obvious, Annuals grow from the seed, they live one season, and then they die. Now they may come back again, and you see them because if they go to seed and that seed gets incorporated into the soil again, then a new plant is growing. It's an offspring of that first one that was growing. But the plant is not coming back from its root system in a second year or a second growing season. A perennial species does come back from its root structure. So in general, the life cycle of a perennial is the first year that it gets planted and it germinates and starts to grow, it is still a, a young species or a young plant. It is a juvenile given, if you will, for that first year. At the end of a second year, you can consider it a fully mature plant. So it is a two-year life cycle. Whatever you see going on on top of the soil with the leaf growth, I make this number up, I don't know. Every species is different. But assume two times as much effort is going on to the root structure underneath the soil that you don't even see and know about. 
So it's that root structure that you're really focused on if you want this species or this plant to really grow well and thrive long after you planted it. That's why we do say even for a drought tolerant species, the more water it can get the first year, the better off you are because you are helping that root structure grow as big and strong as possible so that it's got what it needs later on and it can get water from a much greater area of the soil when we are in a more droughty uh, period of the year. So that's the difference between annual species and perennial species. We'll have a couple of slide examples of this, but I'm gonna talk it through right now. Second uh, set of bullet points are cool season versus warm season grasses. Um, we don't have that many warm season grasses in our part of the country because our growing season is not that long. And that's really what this relates to. There's a lot of biological reasons or differences between cool season and warm season. But cool season grasses are the things that you see greening up even in March some years. They are, those are the existing perennial plants that are coming back from their root structure. So that root structure could be humongous underneath the ground. I've seen examples of one plant that will have more than 10 feet of root. So it's really got a large living mass underneath the soil that can start growing as soon as the conditions are right. It's not waiting for warmer weather to start germinating. Those are cool season grasses. They work really well for us around here in many situations because you don't really want to wait until May and June for your warm seasons to start greening up. That does look, you know, it's a little less pleasing when we've got these wonderful spring days right now. Warm season grasses do need warmer soil temperatures, both to germinate and to green up. So when we're seeing cool seasons green up at the end of March, early April, the warm seasons generally are not even thinking about greening up until late May, early June. And the same thing with seeds. So if you plant warm season grasses, they need much warmer soil temperatures to start germination. Cool season grasses still need warmer temperatures than an established plant. So we may see cool season grasses start germinating with a new planting. End of April would be a good time to start expecting that. Um, what we're looking at is soil temperature, the average soil temperature day and night for several days, let's say a week, and that needs to be above say 40 degrees. Every species is different, so I can't give you the one perfect temperature. Every species is different in what it needs to start germination. But you can tell that that's at least a month, maybe a month and a half difference in that germination period from a cool season to a warm season grass. Next bullet point is the difference between sod forming and bunch grasses. Sod forming grasses are something we don't have very many of around here, but they're wonderful because instead of just growing as a discrete clump or a discrete bunch, they, once they are mature, so in that second year, can send out a lateral root and a new seed or a new plant starts shooting up off of that lateral root. So instead of plants forming bunches, it forms more of a carpet. It can continue to spread. Now spreading grasses can strike fear in some people's hearts and it's an important consideration to make, but um, the parks at the, at the, um, the municipal, municipal parks in Cortez are made from mostly Kentucky bluegrass, not a native grass, but a wonderful sod forming grass. So they can fill themselves in when they get disturbed and they're not bumpy. If you're trying to ride the lawn mower, lawn mower over it, it's a pretty smooth ride. Whereas bunch grasses, and you'll see some examples of real true bunch grasses, do grow as a discrete plant like this. And it claims its territory and another plant establishes in another area and it is its own discrete bunch. Some bunches are much higher, much more disturbing or ankle twisting than others, but most of our grasses are bunch grasses here. So that's an important consideration if you are going to want to mow an area or people will be out there walking on it or something. Uh, moving on to native and non-native. This is a very loose concept. 
people will call us and just say, um, you know, I want some native grasses. And when we try and clarify with them, they mean, well, what was growing here before somebody put in the lawn, which doesn't necessarily mean it's a native grass. In the world of Southwest seed, we take a middle of the road kind of loose definition of what a native grass is. And if it's something that was growing before white people arrived and were starting to tinker with agriculture, we would consider that a native grass. So non-native grasses are things that we have introduced from other countries and especially ones that we have been working with. We've been selecting them for better characteristics for the farmer's field, for the turf lawn at the park, for other factors or other um, situations that we want grasses to grow, but that don't necessarily get answered by a true native grass around here. At the end, I'll talk just a little bit about the spectrum of native. But um, that's kind of our definition or our difference between native and non-native grasses. Drought tolerance is another rather interesting concept. And I say that because the more literature you read online or anywhere, that's about the level of specificity that most people use. Drought tolerant grass. I want a drought tolerant grass. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, it makes a big difference if you're asking for a drought tolerant grass in Michigan or Florida or Colorado. Um, drought tolerant might mean that it can handle only 30 inches of precip a year, or it might mean 8 to 10, like is more what we get here in, in southwest Colorado. So, um, Obviously, a place like Southwest Seed is kind of focused on the grasses that are going to be good for us around here. But as you start reading things online and everything, be a little bit careful or go a little bit deeper as to what they might be talking about when this, they talk about drought tolerance or non-drought tolerant for species. Um, we typically think of our precip in, in this area as between 10 to 12 inches. In some areas, it's down to eight. And a lot of that comes in the form of snow. And our monsoons are so unpredictable and getting more unpredictable that uh, it really does help even with the most drought tolerant of grasses if you've got some kind of supplemental water that you can use for the establishment of new grasses. Um, early cereal workout horses. That's a bunch of weird words to put together. What that really means is a pioneer species or certain grasses that are really designed to be the first things to grow when you are trying to get a new native planting started or when the land has been disturbed. So there are some species that can germinate quickly. They don't last that long, but they're kind of placeholders while other um, slower to germinate, slower to get established natives, take their sweet time coming in. So we'll have a couple of examples of those pioneer species, but they're kind of feel-good grasses. So if it takes a couple of years of patience and trying a couple of times because the, the seed's just not establishing, those pioneer species can really help you. That last con concept was the spectrum of native, so the idea of native or non-native seeds. So if you really enjoy these kinds of topics and dig a little bit, you'll discover that native gets described in many different ways. So an ultimate native species is something that somebody has found locally, can kind of guarantee it's not in an area that probably anybody was planting anything, so it really was growing there. It's just naturally growing. And it's coming from this area the soils, the temperature, the water, you know, the precipitation that that seed has experienced, everything about it is true to this area. And if I bring it, say we're talking about Indian rice grass, a very common species for us to use around here. If I bring an Indian rice grass plant or seed from Idaho, is it a native? Well, to a purist, no, it probably isn't because its genetic makeup doesn't come from right here. But it is a native grass species that was found here and grows in many parts of the United States. So 
that's why I talk about this spectrum of truly local genetics versus a species that we would find in this area. So that's a little bit of an esoteric concept, but some people have dug into this enough to really understand that and to see what we're talking about. Southwest Seed doesn't try and be as local as possible most of the time. What we really want are plants that are proven to germinate and to grow as best they possibly can. And sometimes getting the most local one does not answer that need. So a lot of key concepts. I hope you're jotting questions down if nobody's signing in with a chat question right now. But I'm gonna keep on going then to just an overview of some of the different grasses that we have. So this is our overview. We've got some good slides that people have helped me pull together really quickly. So first of all, um, this does reemphasize that annual versus perennial life cycle. And this is a nasty annual example on the left-hand side, but cheatgrass is a perfect example of an annual. So it grows once, it's gone. However, you can tell from that picture how many seeds it creates so quickly. And so it is um, always putting seed back into the soil seed bank. So that's why you will see cheatgrass come back so easily. Those seeds are always right there, ready for you to disturb the soil a little bit and out they pop again. But being an annual, it does mean if you terminate the seed production, you are reducing the seeds in the soil bank. And over time, the things that you want, especially if they're perennial, will start to dominate and the cheatgrass can't continue to grow. It's not nice and easy. You know, you don't snap your fingers, pull all the plants out one year and it's all gone, but you can get ahead of cheatgrass. Um, on the other hand side, on the right side, is a perennial species, and it's the Indian rice grass, which I had mentioned earlier. And I don't know if you guys can see that pretty well. Once you start noticing this and then walking around outside in some areas that aren't too disturbed, you will see it. It's a beautiful, beautiful grass. It's kind of a lacy, filigree kind of grass, so it makes a good ornamental. It is a true native. It does well in our kind of red... Um, slightly sandy soils around here. It is a bunch grass. It does grow in a very distinct bunch, um, but it holds its look and the, that lacy seed head shape throughout all the year. So even if you, um, you know, it only greens up once a year and makes its seeds, it still is a very nice grass. And we use it in a lot of seed mixes. So it, it's a very common grass for us around here. Next, we talked about the difference between the cool season grasses and the warm season grasses. So a couple of examples of our cool season grasses are a bottle brush squirrel tail and the um, um, needle and thread grass, which uh, is an excellent example. And I hope you all get a chance to identify what this looks like. And then as you're out walking around or driving around, look for a stand of this. It looks like a lacy, um, unidirectional. So when the wind is blowing, everything leans over like you see in that spring screen, and but it has very long arms. So it can get, it's called a needle for a reason. It can get a long, long on or just um, piece of green growth off of each seed. It's not very pleasant for your animals especially if they like to run out in the grasses and things, but it is a beautiful grass and it's got an important role to play in our, um, in our native grass species around here. I apologize, the warm grass season grasses aren't really that close up and descriptive, but you can see kind of what it looks like without needing as much moisture, they do green up a little bit later and stay green. So our cool season grasses, if we don't have moisture, they jump out early in the season, green up, go to seed, and then they go dormant. Whereas the warm season grasses are kind of hanging around waiting for the monsoons, but they do green up later. So um, there is a distinct role for both of those types of grasses. Bunch grasses. I did say I'd give you an example of what bunches look like, and you can really see how this is a very typical landscape for our area. Because we have limited moisture, this may look like bare soil, that one of those principles of soil health I told us to be careful about, 
I'm checking my time real quick. Um, yeah, and real fast, Robbie, we have a question here. Yeah. And it says, are the needle and thread pictures the same grass or different seasons? Same grass. Yeah, same grass, two seasons. Great. Yeah. Um, so what you're seeing in this picture is important to understand. It's not necessarily bare soil. You see bare soil. However, under, right underneath the soil, the roots of each of those clumps of grass are taking up a lot more area under the soil than the actual grass above ground is taking. So that's not that's not the full definition of bare soil because it's not bare underneath the ground. That's a little bit hard to say. I hope that makes sense as to why that really is, given our soils and our moisture regime around here, that really is a healthy soil out, or a healthy plant life out there. Sod forming grasses. In the native world, we don't have that many sod forming grasses that are common for us around here. So what you're seeing is blue grama and it does, after, and it takes a couple of years, but it does start to fill in um, around itself. Now, when what you're seeing on the left-hand side definitely has supplemental moisture. This would not look like this if it were just, you know, the normal whatever Mother Nature was providing. But it does give you an idea of with that extra moisture, and I would, um, this is not mine, but I would be willing to bet that it's a pretty well-established set of blue grama, and they don't water it that frequently, but enough to keep it green and so it's not stressed, it can continue to spread. On the right-hand side, you're seeing blue grama that hasn't been mown, so you're seeing it all the way going to seed. It's got a very characteristic seed head, and it does form clumps also. So when it is stressed, when you don't, it doesn't have enough moisture, then it will form more of a clump and sometimes fairy rings. So that's where the center actually starts to die out and the blue grom is forming a circle. And there's some wonderful examples of that in Hawkins Preserve. Blue grama, just as an interesting side note, is one of that, is at Colorado's state grass. So that's an extra perk in its favor. Robbie, we have a question real fast here from okay. Cameron. She asked, um, steam bank wheatgrass, western wheatgrass, don't they both form sod? Yes, they do. They do. So we do Thank have you. some, we have more than one sod forming grass. Absolutely. Okay, so we're going to, I am running out of time. I'd like to give us some more time for um, questions and answers. So a few um, cool season grasses that we've got examples of here. Mutton grass is a very neat, one of the perks of cool season grasses is they do green up early in the spring. So that's great for wildlife and that is what plays to the strengths of our natural climate here is utilize the early, early uh, moisture that we've got from snow melt and green up right away. So mutton grass is a low growing cool season bunch grass. Um, elk love it. They come onto our farm in January, dig in the snow to get to the mutton grass, which is greening up underneath the snow. That tells you how early they can be. Um, wheat grasses. There are 13 or more different species of wheat grasses, which does make it very confusing as one set of questions were. There's stream bank wheat grass, there's thick spike wheat grass, and western wheat grass. All three of those are sod forming grasses. So they do have that ability to spread and grow. Now that is a great feature most of the time. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes that sod forming feature, especially in a native setting, if there's too much of one of those species and they really start spreading well, they will start to push out other species. So we're normally kind of careful about how much of a sod forming grass we would put into a mixture so that you're not swamping or overwhelming other grasses abilities to uh, perform also. June grass, kind of like the mutton grass, is one of those early season, um, cool season bunch grasses. We have three of them. The next slide's going to show this also. Um, but they are beautiful grasses, uh, kind of lacy. You can see the picture on the right, that lacy seed head. 
I use that word a lot. I think I like the, the seed heads that open up a little bit more compared to the ones that are much more compact. And Sandberg bluegrass. So this is the third type of this early season, low growing, cool season grass. Um, but they're very good species, not necessarily to have this thick, lush planting of them, but they're an excellent species to include in any kind of native planting because they do take that role of a lower understory grass and that early green up, that early um, role in a native planting. And especially if there's wildlife or cattle or something like that that you want to be feeding as well. Arizona fescue is another cool season bunch grass. It grows much taller. It's really excellent as an ornamental. You don't normally see a mono stand of this, so it doesn't grow a lot in one area necessarily, but um, it, it's got this big spread. It uh, likes slightly higher altitudes. It um, uh, gets used a lot for fire restoration. So in slightly higher altitudes, and we're higher, um, but even, you know, starting maybe 7,000, 7,500 feet, that would be a typical range to find this. Idaho fescue, um, another wonderful grass you can see. Now, I actually think, I didn't put this one together, I actually think that the slide on the left, that might be a sheep fescue, um, just because of that light, slightly bluer color. Um, but you can see comparatively to the uh, slide on the right hand side, they both have a, a typical form, which is a lower clump of dense, fine leafed grasses, and then the seed heads shoot up much higher over time. And that's typical also. So anytime you're looking at the height of a grass, recognize seed heads shoot up much higher than the leaf formation of the grass. Bottle brush squirrel tail. So we saw some pictures of the needle and thread grass earlier. And um, it's a, both of these grasses are early serals or those pioneer species, so they can get started pretty easily. Both of them are problematic for livestock and animals. As you can see with the picture on the left, they do kind of get spiky when the seed heads start to mature. And that's the same that is true for the needle and thread grass. So while I think they're wonderful grasses for a lot of us that have pets or, you know, other, other things that we want to do with the land, they may be things that we're a little bit hesitant for. But they are wonderful true natives and they do very well in our low moisture area. They're also more expensive than a lot of other grasses. So, you know, people are careful about how much they put into seed mixes. Moving on to a few warm weather grasses, um, we definitely have some here, but we don't have as many warm season grasses as they do in slightly more southern states or moving back to the Midwest where they have a longer growing season. Um, one of the ones we're seeing here is Gaeta grass, definitely a true bunch grass as you can see in the picture on the left. Um, it's uh, also known as curly grass, so when it starts to go dormant, its leaves will curl up in little spirals. It's not very palatable, so it can be an excellent option for people who are at slightly lower altitudes. It doesn't really thrive above, much above, say, 6,000 uh, feet altitude, but um, if you're trying to, you know, plant something that doesn't attract the deer into your yard all the time, something like Gaeta grass can be an option. Little blue stem is another one that is an excellent um, ornamental. I don't know why they named it blue stem. Blue gets used in a lot of different grasses and it's not really blue. In this case, it's got a more purple hue to it. But when it is starting to head out it, towards the fall, it's a beautiful um, warm season bunch grass that has a great role as or an ornamental. Blue wild rye, we move back to a cool season grass. Um, the wild ryes tend to grow up pretty tall, so sometimes they make nice, if I say a privacy screen, that's not really what I mean. They don't, you know, not the same thing as building a fence, but they do grow up nice and tall, so they can be a good kind of barrier or a change in 
um, the species and the heights and the kind of the interest factor that you might be building into a smaller area if you are kind of looking at this more as landscaping as opposed to just a native grass planting. Mountain brome is a cool season bunch grass. It is an excellent pioneer species. So one of the first ones that will germinate. That and slender wheatgrass are probably two of our best um, pioneer species for the slightly higher altitude areas. So again, I'm talking above say 7,000, 7,500 feet um, or an area that gets a little bit more supplemental moisture. So these would have a hard time establishing here, you know, right inside a Cortez area, something like that. But any higher, you'd get a lot of great success and early, um, early green up and growth while other species are taking longer to get started. I added a couple of shrubs to this presentation um, only because for people that are looking at this as wildlife plantings, adding some shrubs can be a really great way of going uh, because it provides win fall and winter browse. So animals can graze on these after the grasses have browned up and they're really not a lot of uh, nutrients to them. So I added two that we see quite frequently around here four wing salt bush, which is really a kind of cool plant anyhow. Um, it grows pretty easily considering shrubs in general are slower to germinate, slower to get started, and obviously they've got a lot more growth to do before they reach maturity. Um, but four wing salt bush and antelope bitter brush are two that are really great for our altitudes around here and for providing that forage for wildlife. So there are definitely a lot of other options. And I would say that, um, I wrote this down to give you all this reference. If you want more information, if you haven't already found it, one of your best reference sites is the NRCS Plant Fact Sheets and Plant Guides. I'm gonna say that again. The NRCS Plant Facts, no, Plant Fact Sheets and Plant Guides. So that is a list of hundreds of species put in by Latin names. So that can be a little bit of a challenge if you haven't found the Latin name yet. But to get a lot more information about each of these species, where they grow, what their life form is, et cetera. And um, so that you can continue your knowledge and continue to uh, learn about the things that you might want on your land. So I do want to just wrap up with a couple more screens here. First of all, when I came back to Southwest Seed, so my parents started this business 40 plus years ago, I've only been back for about 15 years, but I discovered how beautiful seeds are as the beginning of the whole growth process. So I just wanted to share why this is such a neat thing to everybody. You can come over and see, the, see these samples someday if you'd like. Um, and then just a little bit about planting because people have a very difficult time understanding how to estimate seeds and how to get seeds in the ground. So this is just an example of probably the most minimal seed planting um, spread rate that you might want to consider. Now it's not practical that you're gonna go out and count out 40 seeds and scatter them over one square foot, but it gives you an idea how small an amount of seed that is. That is literally like a quarter of a teaspoon full of seed. Maybe, maybe not even that many. It is a very small amount of seed. And if every single one of those seeds germinated, it would be very crowded because you saw what one of those big clumps of grass looks like. One clump of grass could take up this whole area, but you need quite a few seeds to feed the birds a few extra and know that some just won't thrive or 20 will thrive, but over time, a few will dominate and the rest will get pushed out. A much more typical planting looks something like this, where people just feel like it's not enough seed and they put a lot more down. There's no harm in getting extra seed on the ground, but at some point, plant a dollar bill as opposed to some seed, you're gonna get the same results. Not much happening. The last thing I wanted to say, and I think Bonnie will help us with this also, is that we do have a couple of seed packets for everybody. So in order for us to have your address, um, we need you to fill out the SurveyMonkey link, which is right here, and you will get a copy of this also, and Bonnie will help you with it. But this is what it looks like. So two different packets, 
Annie's annuals on the left and the Montezuma native mix on the right. And here's what's in them. So if you fill out that information, you'll get a copy of this also. And you'll also get it with um, this presentation when you send that to, or when Bonnie sends it out. But these are a couple of, so a wildflower mix on the Annie's annuals. Those are annuals. First year, you'll get a lot of color. Scratch the ground at when they've gone to seed and you should get a lot of things coming back again. And then on the right hand side is a native mix of grasses and um, it's got some sunflower in it. So a little bit of fun and color as you get going. So I think that's the end of mine. I'm probably speeding up because I'm very conscious of the time now. So I'm gonna be quiet and let people ask their questions. Yeah, so um, just gonna jump in real fast and explain something that SurveyMonkey link, everyone. If you already filled out the SurveyMonkey link to register for this event, we already have your information. It's just if you only like saw it on Facebook and clicked the Zoom link, then we wouldn't have your mailing information for the packet. So if you already filled out the SurveyMonkey link, you don't need to do it again. But if you haven't done that, please fill that out. We'll send you a follow-up email with a recording of this webinar after we're done, as well as um, the entire slide, slide deck from Robbie. And that's how you get the seed packet. So um, I hope that helps clarify. I know Travis was gonna jump in and then I have some questions teed up for Q&A after he's done. Thank you, Bonnie. And, and thank you, Robbie. That was fantastic. I, I hope folks really enjoyed that. Uh, just a couple quick things before we jump into Q&A in case people have to take off. Um, I think Bonnie might have mentioned it, but the webinar is recorded. So we will be getting that out as well. So if you know other folks that weren't able to make it today, or that might find some of this information interesting, it should be available uh, next week or so. Um, also wanna remind folks we have another event this week. Uh, we're doing our, our first annual virtual beer tasting with Wild Edge uh, Brewery. Uh, you can get more information on the website, montezumaland.org. There's an events page off the homepage. And uh, if you have any interest in, in that participating in that event, uh, it is a ticketed event, but you can pick up some beer from Wild Edge and then join us for some conversation about beer uh, brewing and conservation. That'll be on Friday, May 1st at 6.30. Um, also, definitely welcome any suggestions for future webinars. Feel free to shoot us an email or uh, drop it through the website or put it in the chat box here. But if you have items of interest or topics of interest that you'd like us to uh, cover in future webinars, we'd love to hear it. Um, and then lastly, as always, you know, it, because we're in difficult times, I uh, just encourage folks, if you enjoyed your experience today um, and wanna help support MLC to do more of this work and to continue to do our work in the county to protect land and provide education opportunities, uh, please feel free to make a small, meaningful donation, whatever, whatever accounts for you uh, through the website if that's something uh, you're capable of doing and want to do. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. It helps us uh, keep staff employed, do this work, and continue to protect land here uh, in our community. So I'll turn it over to Bonnie with that, and I know she's got a few, a couple questions, and if folks have others, uh, definitely put them through the chat box and we'll get them answered. Yeah, so um, the first question here comes from Katie, and Katie wants to know if you have any recommendations on stabilizing a bare hillside. <laughs> That's one of the more difficult situations. Yes, um, if you can, if you've got rocks, old logs, anything you can kind of put onto that, that bank, even if you know that that's going to be temporary, if you're trying to get things to grow, gravity is not your friend. It's going to pull your moisture and your seeds right down that slope and erosion is kind of the logical follow through. So, um, when we talk about what kind of seeds to help you with, we look at a range of the root structures themselves. So if everything can get established, then you're doing, you know, at least through the, the plants that are growing, you're getting as much stabilization with the roots. But then you also want to do what you can with those rocks and logs 
and they just act as little check dams to hold the seeds in place for a while and hold a little moisture, you can use things, there are erosion control type products also. So if it's a really steep slope, that may be your most important thing to start, you know, to start with. Um, and the more steep the slope, the harder it is to get that established. So that's a tough situation. Colin, we can talk more about it sometime. Okay, next question is from Tamara. She asked, are there preferred grasses for mancus shale versus red soil? Um, the easy answer is yes, but that's still a hard answer also because there's not that much distinction. Um, the more we can get organic matter in the mancus shale, the more you're making that soil a better location for more plants to grow. Um, and so, most everything will grow in the mancus shale unless it's, you know, unless there's really no soil there. Um, but the red, the red, more low sladen soils are easier to grow on. Okay, I have an, another question here from Katie. Um, she was wondering if you have any recommendations on shade trees. Trees are not really my specialty. So I would say that the nursery or um, there's animus arborists and I forget the name of David Temple's business, but there are some people who are so much better prepared to help you with the shade trees or any trees. Sounds good, thank you. Okay, we have one from um, Cecile and Warren. Is it helpful to aerate when in dry land that grows tumbleweed and wild must? Is it helpful to aerate in yep. an area that grows tumbleweed and wild mustard? I'm guessing so, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I don't actually know how to answer that question. Travis, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think maybe, and Cecile and Warren, if you have an expansion on this, uh, feel free to chime in. Um, the, I think in Robbie's talk about the healthy soil components, um, that's our biggest concern. You know, a lot of people on dry land or even in their yards, they're, they're aerating for, uh, to relieve compaction and to hopefully also get more water infiltration. Um, the best thing you can do for better water infiltration, especially on dry land ground around here uh, in the clay soils is reduce as much disturbance as possible. Um, it's really those plant roots and living organisms that uh, create the aggregate structure that Robbie was talking about that ultimately lets water in. Um, initially, the tillage and plowing and things like that will, will let some immediate water in, but eventually it leads to compaction. And so I think, um, I don't know that aeration would help prevent tumbleweeds or wild mustard. Um, certainly getting something established. When I worked for the NRCS and the Soil Conservation District here in Montezuma County, I saw a lot of dry land ground with uh, plantings on them where the first couple seasons, those young grass plants would just be really tiny and setting a lot of root structure and you'd get a lot of annual weeds and even some perennial weeds coming in. Um, but like Robbie said, sometimes it's just a real patience game. Um, get, the, get the seed out there that you want, try and get things established. And um, some of those fields that seemed really weedy those first two years, really in that second or third year, the grass really took off and it was surprising how quickly the grasses then take over that ecosystem. So um, at the end of the day, I think sticking to those soil health principles and then trying to get what you want established is the route to go. Okay, I have a question from Jean. She said she got a packet of Palmer Penstemon seeds um, on your flower walk last year. When is a good time to plant those seeds? Right now, right now. So our soil temperatures are going to start shooting up in these days that we're starting to get these really lovely temperatures up into the 80s. Um, and so there, if you have in a true dry land situation, so you really don't have any supplemental moisture, your best time to plant is generally um, in the fall so that the seeds are in the soil over winter, ready to take advantage of all the soil moisture and warm temperatures as soon as they exist. But if, if your seeds are not already in the ground, then this is a good time 
and I am making the assumption that you do have some supplemental moisture. Most plants take somewhere between 10 and 30 days to germinate. That's a gross generalization, but 10 to 30 days, those seeds need to be in the soil in the presence of moisture in order to germinate. And so it's a great time. The temperatures are warm enough to germinate, but they need the moisture now also. Great. Um, I have another question here from Cecile and Warren. Um, is red clover good for the land? Absolutely. So red clover is a part of the legume family and legumes are nitrogen fixers by their very nature. And so um, it gets overblown in how important legumes are because we think, oh, they're automatically putting a lot of nitrogen into the soil, but they're using most of their own nitrogen until they're terminated. So until they die, they're using most of their nitrogen, but it adds to that diversity of different species you're putting in the soil, and they do fix more nitrogen in the soil in general. So um, not only clovers, but field peas, um, alfalfas, um, there's a, a species called sanfoin, which is a non-bloat legume, which gets used. It's not a true native, but it's more native or it's used in more native situations. Um, so any of those are great things to add to a planting. Great um, question from Steve, which I'm also curious about. So thanks for asking, Steve. Um, any suggestions on how to get rid of bindweed? <laughs> um, <laughs> No, not really. Um, I have an incredible poster. It's a depressing poster, but a poster here that shows how the different types of weed control work on some of our most obnoxious and noxious weeds. And it's really a whole bunch of unhappy faces as opposed to smiley faces, and bindweed is one of them. So there are not very many cultural practices or non-herbicide oriented practices that can really get rid of bindweed. And bindweed is kind of nasty because if you start trying to dig it out, it will just regenerate from pieces of its root. So it can come back at you doubly hard if you're not careful. That's depressing. Okay, thanks Robbie. <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. Um, the next question is actually a great um, follow-up question. Um, from Katie, what do we do with the massive amounts of Russian knapweed on our land? So, you know, a great seminar that might be good to, for MLC to try and put on would be something with our weed district. Our weed coordinator, Bonnie Loving, has spent a lot of time trying to come up with good answers to these questions and to understand the different practices that are most viable for here in our area. And um, so rather than me spend much time, partly because I don't try and do weed eradication, I try and, you know, kind of give you the broad overview and then I'll tell you, well, if you're willing to use herbicides, go to Basin Co-op, go to IFA, go to the, you know, the people that sell that and really work with it, or the nurseries are very good just in smaller quantities. Um, but I think my best answer is to defer to maybe another webinar if we can get Bonnie to do it with us.